All right. John chapter 21. For our text this morning, for our scripture this morning, we're looking at an encounter that Jesus would have had with a few of his disciples. I want to share this, this with you this morning. Now, for those of you who would have gone to school when I would have been at school, we would have had a way of doing subtraction and division and, and stuff in school. Um, there was a way that we would have gone about engaging in division. I remember when, when I was at school, I would learn to divide one way and then at school, you would, you would learn to do division a little differently. And my teacher is online here, so she would be able to testify to that. Um, but there was a way that we, were, that we were taught as children how to do division. And for us, that was the only way that division could be done. Now, modern schools now are doing division a little differently. And for those of us who have kids who are in school, they might come home with a little different way of doing division. And you might think, well, I did division my way, and this is the only way that division needs to be done. But somehow, for our kids today, they're learning different ways to do division. They're learning new ways to be able to divide, right? And it is on us as adults and as persons who are a little older to, to kind of adjust to that new way of dividing and understanding that, yes, we may have learned it one way. There may have been one way that we would have done it. But somehow there is another way that allows us to still be effective and get results, okay? Now, when we look at our passage this morning, when we look at our text, we encounter some disciples of Jesus who would have been engaging in fishing. And they would have, they would have had one way of fishing. This was their way of engaging in fishing for all their lives. And yet, somehow, somebody came on the shore and challenged them. And challenge them to do something a little different right to do something a little differently in order for them to get productive results so let's look at our text john 21 and i'm going to read the first nine verses of this chapter all right john 21 verses 1 to 9 and it reads afterward jesus appeared again to his disciples by the sea of tiberius it happened this way simon peter thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, have you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire burning, sorry, when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Amen. Lord, may your word go forth to your people and may they hear you speaking through me in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So here's our passage this morning, John 21. And in our text, the gospel writer who, who has been, who have been, who has been presumed to be the, the apostle John, um, John being the son of Zebedee, John the divine as he's called. John is writing here in this passage and he's given an account where the disciples have already met Jesus a couple of times. Actually, they've actually met him two times. And shortly after this, the second occasion where they met him, after his resurrection, so this is the post-resurrection account, after meeting Jesus, having been raised from the dead for a second time, Peter came up with the idea that he was going to go fishing. 
he was going to go and do something that he was accustomed to do. Remember Peter, Peter's occupation was, fisherman, was a fisherman. And before he would have met Jesus, that would have been his way of life. And not only Peter, but also some of the other disciples, including James and John and Peter's brother, Andrew. They were all fishermen. So Jesus has, has encountered them two times already. And they decided after the second time, look, we are going to go fishing. Peter comes up with that idea. And the text opens up with letting us know that Jesus had appeared to them at the Sea of Tiberias or the Sea of Galilee. That's another name for the Sea of Tiberias. And John frames out this particular account in such a way that he gives us, he gives us the information at the beginning. Jesus met them at the Sea of Tiberias and then he goes into the account itself of how that all took place. Now, John is an interesting gospel writer because John, John does not choose to give us the writings always chronologically. He doesn't give us a chronological account of things that happened. But John's purpose was not to give us a chronology of things, but he wanted us to understand just how Jesus operated. He actually said in the previous chapter that his purpose was not given so you have, he was not given them so that you could have the order of activity of Jesus' life, but so that we would believe that Jesus was the Son of God. So here is John giving us an account. He started out by giving us the information that Jesus met with them at the Sea of Tiberias, and then he goes into the, the details, so to speak, of what happened. Almost like a film where you start a movie, and they give you a snippet of what happens later on in the film, and then they go back. And they, they kind of bring you up to, pe up to speed as to what took place leading up to what would have happened when they show you that snippet of the end at the beginning of your film. All right. So here's what happened. Simon Peter, he decided he was going to go fishing. And six others of the disciples decided to go with him. The Bible identifies them. It identifies Thomas. It identifies Nathaniel. And it specifically identifies the two sons of Zebedee, who will be James and John. So we have Peter, Nathaniel, Thomas, James, and John. And then this, John decides to say, look, there were two other disciples. For whatever reason, he did not identify those two other disciples. But we know that there were two others there, meaning that there were a total of seven of them who would have gone to the Sea of Galilee. So Peter lets them know, look, I'm going fishing. And these guys, they say, yeah, Pete, we're coming with you. We're going with you. Right? So they went out and got into the boat. And that night, they caught nothing. Now, reason for them going fishing at night, and I must declare my hand up front, I am not a fisherman. Um, I know very little about fishing other than I like fish. But Peter, they, 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 they let them know, look, we are going out fishing and they're going at night. And fishing at night evidently was more advantageous because... Um, it, it allowed them to be able to get more fish at night than if they went during the heat of the day or what's not. So they chose to go at night. And again, these are seasoned fishermen. So they would know, well, it makes sense to go at night and to get our fish. So they go out and they cast their nets. And somehow for the entirety of that night, they caught nothing. Now, the Bible does not say that they cast their nets on the left side of the boat. But clearly based on the fact that when they had their encounter with Jesus and he mentioned on the right, to cast their nets on the right side, it meant that their nets were on the left side of the boat for the entirety of that night. Now, again, these are seasoned fishermen. So they would know, okay, in order for us to catch fish, we need to put our nets on a specific side of the boat so that the fish can come in and we can get all the fish that we need or we want um, in order to catch them in. So they were just going based on their own experience, on their own knowledge, on their own wisdom of fishing. So they cast their nets on the side that they would have expected to find fish. Again, this is out of their experience. But for whatever reason, they caught nothing. They were not able to catch anything that entire night. So for them, it could have been seen as maybe a waste of time, a waste of, of energy, a waste of effort in terms of we have sat here all night. We have caught absolutely nothing, not even a car. Not even a little guppy, nothing. We ain't got anything in our nets to show for to show for the fact that we've been here all night. So the Bible says in verse 4, early in the morning. So clearly, after Jesus' resurrection had come early in the morning, it had great significance. 
And here in this particular account, it has tremendous significance too. So John says, look, early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not recognize him. So for these disciples, they are in their boat, having caught nothing, probably frustrated by the fact that they have caught nothing. And this person appears on the shore and they recognize that it is somebody on the shore, even though they cannot identify specifically who it is. Now, whether it was that Jesus purposely hid himself, purposely concealed his identity, whether it was that God did not want them to see that it was him, or whether it was a case where just because it was early in the morning, it wasn't full light out, they could not make out physically who it was and see him specifically. For whatever reason, all they could see was that there was somebody on the shore and they did not know who that person was. And that person decides to say, look, he asked him a question. Friends, do you have any fish? He's asking him, look, I know that you are fishing. Do you have anything? Have you caught anything? And maybe for the disciples, maybe for these guys, they would have figured, but well, either this person is trying to make sport at us or he's genuinely concerned about us. So they respond and they say, look, no, plain and simple, no. We haven't caught anything, right? So as a response to that response given to, to this person, Jesus then goes on to say, look, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. In, us, in essence, he's saying, look, I know that you've, you've got your nets on this side for the entire night. Try this, for, try this instead. Take the nets and cast them on the other side of, your, of the boat. Now, again, these are seasoned fishermen. These are guys who know exactly what it takes to fish and how they needed to cast their nets and to spread their nets. Yet this person is telling them to do something unconventional. Something that does not make sense, that does not necessarily make sense to them. But what they do is, they decide, look, we are, going to, we are going to follow this suggestion being made. And they throw their nets onto the right side of the boat. Maybe they, would have, maybe they may have been in a situation where it's like, look, we've done all we could for the entirety of the night. And we decided we're going to just throw it on the other side. Or they might have said, but we, in, in their own minds, they could have said, well, we would have tried this already. And it didn't work before, but whatever, we can do it, right? They, make, they, they take on the suggestion and they throw the net onto the right side of the boat. They're doing something out of their, out of their comfort zone, so to speak. That is a bit unconventional. Again, like in our division illustration from earlier. They might have said, look, but this is how we've done it all the time. We divide this way all the time. But this person is telling us, no, I want you to try this other way of doing division. And so they cast the net onto the other side and here's what happens when they do that when they did that they were unable to haul their nets in they were unable to haul in the net imagine that they did something unconventional following the suggestion of some person that they did not know who they did not know who they did not recognize they followed his suggestion and threw their nets over onto the other side and because of taking those steps of faith there i say their nets become filled with fish, full of fish. And as soon as that happens, as soon as they catch the nets on the other side of the, of the boat and the fish come into the nets and the nets are filled, the disciple whom Jesus loved lets me to know, look, that is the Lord, that is Jesus. Now, I, I love that it is the, that is written as the disciple whom Jesus loved because that disciple is identified in most scholarly articles as the apostle john as john son of zebedee saint john the divine and it's it's kind of interesting that he's writing the passage and he made sure to let us know that this is the disciple who jesus loved right so john tells peter look that is jesus that is jesus there who has now given us this suggestion in essence given us this instruction to cast our nets onto the other side and we can see the evidence of that because when we did what he said to do our nets were filled with fish. Doing what Jesus said allowed them to have a full catch, a full net of fish. Peter, in his imp impetuous state, doesn't even wait to run. From the moment he realizes, based on what John would have said to him, that that is Jesus on the shore, he puts on his outer garment. Now, Peter would have been declothed, so to speak, or unclothed in, in his element here and fishing. And he, in essence, he just he says to put on something really quick 
and he jumps into the water. That's that that was Peter in his impetuous state. He's not concerned in his necessarily about helping the rest with the fish at that particular stage but he, de he decides look that is jesus maybe i need to get to him quickly so he jumps into the water and after jumping into the water the writer lets us know the other disciples followed in the boat towing the net full of fish for they were not far from the shore they were about 100 yards away from the shore and they decided look we need to bring our boat in we're going to get our boat in because now we've identified that this is the master on the shore. Let us go and get close to him. Okay? So when they landed on the shore, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Now here's, here's the interesting thing. Jesus identified that they may have been fishing all night and caught nothing. He told them to cast their nets on the other side of the boat and they were, in, they were allowed to, they, they were able to get a whole set of fish. But somehow when they got to shore, Jesus already had fish and bread there waiting for them. Now where did Jesus get his fish from? Where did he get this bread from? The, the text does not identify that. But clearly he had provisions there waiting for them. Provisions there waiting for them to feed them physically. Having satisfied their faith that would have been extended to him, had asked after they would have cast their nets onto the other side of the boat. Here is Jesus. Here is Jesus telling them to do something unconventional for them as fishermen. Very, very interesting. So why is this account, this particular account, really important? Why is it important for us to know this? Well, there are times in our lives where God might ask us to do something that to us does not make sense. To us does not seem like it, it, call, it, it, it goes together. And we're living in a situation now, we're, we're experiencing COVID-19 and we have all these different quarantines and our restrictions and everything. We're asked to do things that are outside of the, the norm for us as human beings. You know, we are, we, are cult, we are community beings, especially if you live here in Barbados. We love to engage with each other, be close to one another. But yet we're being asked to do something a bit unconventional in order for us to remain safe. Jesus' purpose for asking them to do something outside of what they were accustomed to doing or ordinarily doing, it wasn't necessary to keep them safe, but it was to show them or it was to demonstrate to them just exactly who he was and his actual power and his authority, even over fish, even over the conventions of fishing. Why is that important? Because there are times in our lives where we're asked to do things unconventionally. And God might ask us to do things that will, step, that will cause us to step out of our comfort zones, out of our comfort areas, and we can be very resistant to that. We can be very hesitant to that. The disciples could have said, you do not know anything about fishing before they identified that it was Jesus. They could have said, look, you don't know anything about fishing. We are the pros here. We are the ones who have the answers. We know what we are supposed to do. So thanks, but no thanks. They could have, they could have said that. But instead of that, they decided, look, we are going to do something out of our norms, out of our ordinary in order to see what would result, what would happen. And when God asks us to do things that are unconventional, oftentimes we can be hesitant and resistant. But you know what? Oftentimes, the results that we get from doing things that are unconventional can blow us out of the water. And, and I'm not using any puns here, even though it's a, it's a water illustration here in our text. But it can be a situation where our nets can become so filled beyond what we have or what we think we can hold on to. Right? So when God calls us to do the unconventional, when we get stuck, when we feel as if we can't go any further, do what God asks us to do. Because evidently he has the answers. He knows, he knows where the fish are, even when we can't see them. He knows where the miraculous catch is, even when we cannot see it. He knows. He sees. Right? So what are we supposed to do? What are we supposed to do? when we are so we're so bogged down and it seems as though look what we are doing this is our way of doing it even if it does not work we are so bent on doing it here are three things we can do one acknowledge that look what we are doing isn't working what i'm being asked what i am accustomed to doing what i have been doing all this time is not necessarily working it is not giving me the results that i need step two Ask the Lord for his assistance 
in getting you out. So after acknowledging, look, what I am doing is not working. You say, look, God, I need your help. I need your assistance in getting me out of this situation in allowing me to be able to receive what I am looking to receive, what I am looking to experience here. And then step three, follow whatever instructions God gives you to, to do. Whatever God commands you to do, what he instructs you to do. Dear I say, what we may suggest to you to do, even if it means going against your own convention, do it. Follow the instructions of God. So here are these three steps again. Acknowledge that what you're doing is not, even though it's what you're accustomed to doing, is not necessarily working. Ask God to give you the instruction to help you, to ask him for his assistance in aiding you to get out of that condition, out of that situation. And three, follow whatever instructions he gives, whatever he suggests to you, do them. Wherever you are at, whatever situation you are in, whatever condition you may be experiencing right now, God is the one who has the solution. God is the one who has the solution. He, saw, he, he is our great problem solver. His solutions don't always look how we want them to look. His convention doesn't always go according to our own convention. But dear I say, his ways are always best. The scripture lets us know the ways of the Lord are above our ways. His thoughts are above our thoughts. Why is that? Because he's God. Because he's the ultimate source. He's the, he's the almighty God. He's the one who exists outside of time. He's the one who actually created time. He knows the end from the beginning. So here's the thing. If you know somebody who knows the end from the beginning, would it make sense to lean on that person, to trust on that person, since he already knows the end from the beginning and you do not know the end? Sometimes you barely know the beginning, but God knows the end from the beginning. Amen. So why don't we just trust him? Why don't we lean in on him? We say, look, Lord, you are asking me to do something unconventional. You're asking me to step out of my comfort zone. You're asking me to do something unusual in order for me to get unstuck. But God, I'm going to trust in your ways. I'm going to trust in your suggestion. I'm going to trust in what you are telling me to do, what you're instructing me to do. I love that the disciples, even though, even though they did not recognize who Jesus was initially, they followed what he said. They did what he said. And it resulted in them experiencing a catch, experiencing a blessing beyond more than they could have even asked or dreamed about. Maybe if they had gone out and fish for that night and they had caught a few fish, not necessarily the, great, the catch that they had, but just a few fish, they may have been a little more hesitant to follow the instruction of Jesus. Sometimes we get a little, we get, we make a little headway in our own strength and we figure, well, I don't need God. God, I don't need your suggestions. I cool. I'm making it. But when we encounter situations and we are born dry, we are born, born dry. And our, our lives are just to that point where whatever we are doing is not working. Then we understand, look, really and truly, God is the one who's supreme. God is the one who's the ultimate authority. He is the one who has all the answers. And if he has all the answers, if his suggestion is unconventional, if he's the one with the answers, then it would make sense to do what he says, to trust him, to follow him. Jesus' disciples, fishermen though they were, experienced though they were, they were willing to do something different. They were willing to follow the instructions of some person they could not see. And then they recognized that it was Jesus. Let us do what God asks us to do. Let us recognize him, even in our difficult circumstances. Recognize that he has the answers for us and never turn our backs or reject him. Don't reject him. Follow, let's follow the disciples. Let us follow the disciples here in that they follow the instructions of Jesus Christ and it resulted in them experiencing a catch beyond anything that they could have imagined. I don't know about you, but I would love to experience a tremendous catch in my life. I would love to experience a great catch right now in my life. And I'm sure you would love to experience that in your lives too. And whatever that might look like, whatever that might, might look like, allow yourselves to be surrendered to God in order for him to, to, to give this explosion to you of his grace, of his mercy, and of his blessings. Even in our situations now, again, where we are confined, Confinement is no restriction to God. Confinement does not prevent God from giving us a bountiful explosion of his goodness 
and of his blessings. Amen and amen. Amen. Isn't God good? Isn't God good? Will you try that today? Try, try Jesus and, and the unconventional method he might be asking you to embark on today or tomorrow or whenever going forward in your life. Try that unconventional method that he's extending to you and see him work out miraculous things in your lives. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you that even when we come to the end of our tether and we try all that we can in our own wisdom, in our own understanding, you still make yourself available to let us know, look, try me. Try doing this in my, in the instruction that I'm giving to you and see me work out things in your lives. God, I'm asking that for every single person who's tuning in here this morning, that God, that they will cast their nets over to the right side of the boat, that they will cast their nets over to the other side and watch you work in a miraculous way in their lives. Help us, God, not to be resistant to your instructions. Help us, God, not to be hesitant in, to, in your instructions, claiming that we know better, but help us, God, to surrender to the fact that you are the one who has all the knowledge, who is the ultimate source of everything, and who is the one that we need to surrender our lives to and to lean, lean on and to lean into. We thank you again, God, for doing it in our lives. We thank you, God, for the way that you're going to work out things in our lives, for the blessings that you will bestow upon us, for the miraculous catch of fish that we will experience in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen and amen. So let us try that today in our lives. Casting our nets over to the other side of the boat, so to speak. Casting our nets over to the other side, even when convention says, don't do it that way. Let us try, let us try Jesus' way this morning. Let us try God's way this morning. And even if it doesn't make sense to you, or even to those around you, God's way is always best. God's way always results, always, always results in what is best in our lives. Amen and amen.